Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Evidence-Based Practice. This is Lecture E. The component, the culture of healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. The objectives for evidence-based practice are to define the key tenets of evidence-based medicine, or EBM, and its role in the culture of healthcare. Construct answerable clinical questions and critically appraise evidence answering them. Explain how EBM can be applied to intervention studies, including the phrasing of answerable questions, finding evidence to answer them, and applying them to given clinical situations. Describe how EBM can be applied to key clinical questions of diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. Discuss the benefits and limitations to summarizing evidence. Describe how EBM is used in clinical settings through clinical practice guidelines and decision analysis. This lecture discusses the two remaining types of basic clinical questions, harm and prognosis. We first discuss the use of evidence-based medicine to assess questions about harm or etiology. What causes a disease? Diseases may be caused by things in the air or water bacteria, chemicals, radiation from the sun, or they may be caused by things that we do, such as a medical intervention that has a complication. The primary issue with assessing harm or etiology is not whether someone who is exposed to some kind of agent gets ill, but whether those who have that illness have had a higher rate or amount of exposure. For example, just because someone who uses a cell phone gets brain cancer does not necessarily mean that the cell phone causes brain cancer. In fact, let's look at an example. Suppose we think that a certain chemical causes cancer. The ideal way to assess harm is to do a randomized controlled trial. So the best thing to do would be to get a group of people together and randomize half of them to getting exposed to the chemical and half of them not getting exposed. But obviously, exposing people to a chemical that might cause cancer is unethical, so we can't do that. We need other kinds of study designs that enable us to detect whether something causes harm. We have to go down to the next best level of evidence, which is observational studies. However, we need to be careful in how we interpret observational studies to ensure that they answer our questions. Here are some examples of questions that have come up in the news media about whether things cause harm. Back in the mid and early 1990s, there was the issue of whether silicone breast implants caused autoimmune diseases, such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. It was definitely true that some women who had implants developed these diseases, which are commonly called connective tissue diseases. But they didn't develop them at a higher rate than those who had no breast implants. So silicone breast implants don't appear to cause these autoimmune diseases despite the many lawyers who believe to the contrary. Another question that came up in the 1990s was whether a number of anti-obesity drugs on the market at the time, such as fenfluramine and fentermine, also called fenfen, caused problems such as heart valve abnormalities. It turned out that those who used the drugs actually did develop certain heart abnormalities at a higher rate than those who didn't use the drugs. When we're assessing studies of harm, we essentially have a hierarchy of evidence. A randomized, controlled trial provides the best form of evidence, and often we can use a randomized, controlled trial to determine harm. The next best study is a cohort study, followed by a case control study, and then a case series or an individual case report, the weakest form of evidence. Although a randomized, controlled trial would provide the best evidence for harm, it often can't be done, or it would be unethical to do so. Therefore, we have to use lesser forms of evidence. Another type of study is a cohort study. This is a prospective study where we take a group of patients who get exposed to something, and we follow them forward in time, but don't randomize them. Cohort studies can be useful when poor outcomes are pretty rare, such that a huge sample size would be required. For example, upper gastrointestinal hemorrhage that occurs with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, such as Motrin and Naproxen, turns out to be relatively rare. We see it in clinical practice because so many patients take these drugs, but the rate of bleeding from NSAIDs is actually relatively low. In fact, it is difficult to do a clinical trial to detect that. So a cohort study can help us in a situation where these poor outcomes are rare.
Of course, cohort studies are problematic when the groups aren't similar. For example, if we follow a cohort of people and we compare those who take the NSAID and those who don't, they are obviously different people. Those who take the NSAID are more likely to have ongoing medical problems, particularly those who require these drugs. So we don't get that benefit of randomization. A case control study is the most common form of observational study, and it's the most common type of study done to assess harm. There are times when we suspect that something is harmful, and we want to find out as quickly as possible. We can't do a prospective study because it might take years to get results, so we look retrospectively. We identify cases of the disease that we think are caused by the harmful agent, and then we match them to controls, thus the name case control study. Then we look at the two groups, those who have the disease and those who are the controls, and we see if there's a different rate or amount of exposure. This type of study, for example, enabled us to see that there was not a higher rate of use of breast implants in patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Similar to cohort studies, case control studies can be useful when the condition is rare. It can also be useful when the condition has a long development time. In fact, that's how it was determined that the drug DES, which was taken off the market in the 1950s, causes vaginal cancer in women. One of the problems with case control studies is that they can create spurious associations. A case in point was a study that purported to detect a linkage between coffee consumption and pancreatic cancer. This study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it carried the prestige of that journal. It turns out that those who ran the study used the wrong control group, which shows you that sometimes even in the best of journals, bad science can get through. They used people who had other gastrointestinal diseases as the control participants. Many gastrointestinal diseases have symptoms that are exacerbated by coffee, particularly gastroesophageal reflux. People with these other diseases drink less coffee. So when you use them as a control group of cases versus those with pancreatic cancer, the people with pancreatic cancer drink more coffee, but the coffee is not the cause of their cancer. They drink more coffee because they can tolerate it better. In fact, when this study was repeated with an appropriate control group over a decade later, that association was disproven, and those of us who drink coffee can rest assured that we aren't causing pancreatic cancer in ourselves. The lowest form of evidence is the case series, or even worse, the single case report. The reason a case series provides the lowest form of evidence is that there's no comparison group. A case series can be used to generate a hypothesis that could then be tested with more rigorous study designs, but a case series or case report in and of itself isn't considered to provide high-quality evidence. A classic example of poor evidence resulting from a case series is the drug Bendectin that came out in the 1980s as treatment for nausea in pregnancy. We should always be careful about giving any medication to pregnant women but it turns out that Bendectin was unfairly singled out. The adverse publicity was so strong that it was taken off the market. Some women actually benefited from the drug because one of the ingredients in Bendectin was a vitamin. Bendectin was a combination of two agents, both of which were known to be effective and neither of which had any harmful effects. But because there was a case series of birth defects, Bendectin was taken off the market, withdrawing an effective treatment for women with nausea from pregnancy. In 2013, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, approved the two ingredients, doxylamine and pyridoxin, and they are now offered in a delayed release pill as a first line treatment for the management of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Let's make a few comments about prognosis. One of the important things to know about prognosis is that it's actually hard to do a good prognosis study because prognosis is the natural history of a disease, how the disease actually unfolds. In this day and age, there's very little in the history of a disease that is natural. In almost every disease, we intervene in some way, whether through diagnostic tests or treatments. Many studies end up measuring prognosis after some form of test or intervention. We may measure prognosis for a group of patients who have been diagnosed with a certain condition, or we may measure prognosis for a group of individuals who have been given a certain treatment for a particular condition. When we start to do that, the differences between a prognosis study and a treatment study start to blur a little bit. The most common way that we measure prognosis is with a survival curve. 
This slide shows a survival curve from one type of cancer when it is diagnosed at different stages. Like many cancers, the later the stage of the cancer, the worse the prognosis. Patients who have stage 1 of this particular cancer have a good prognosis, but those who have stage 4 are likely to die within 7 years. Here are some example studies. Several prognosis studies have looked at children who were extremely preterm, had extremely low birth weight, and were in neonatal intensive care units. There are a number of ethical and philosophical issues about how much intervention is desirable for these extremely small children, and a prognosis study gives us an indication of how they do, especially in this case, six years out. A 2005 study followed a cohort of 241 children from the United Kingdom and Ireland who were born at 25 or fewer weeks gestation, extremely preterm. They were compared with classmates in their schools who were born at full term. The differences were substantial. 41% of the preterm children had serious impairment on a variety of cognitive tests compared with 1.3% of their full term classmates. Another study of prognosis was published on prostate cancer, specifically untreated early localized prostate cancer. This study focused on a group of men who were diagnosed between 1977 and 1984 and had regular long-term follow-up. Today, many of those men would have had surgery, but this study gives us an indication of the natural history of the disease. About 17% of these men developed generalized disease, in other words, the cancer spread or metastasized to other areas, and 16% of the men died of the disease. This is another demonstration that many men who develop prostate cancer do not die from it, and it does not even spread outside their prostate. This concludes Lecture E of Evidence-Based Practice. In summary, questions about harm assess whether exposure to some natural or man-made agent causes disease, and these questions are usually answered with a case control study. Questions about prognosis tell us the natural course of the disease.